these out for the fall. These, some are green and some are white because that's the color that was in the copier when I pushed print and I didn't want to throw away the green one. So if you don't want a green one and you're handed a green one, you tell Pastor Falls you don't want a green one, you want a white one, and uh, he'll be happy to do that for you. I know if you're like me, it would bother me to have a green one if all of my other ones were white ones. Now, if, if they were all multicolored throughout the entire lesson series, it wouldn't bother me a bit, but I, I just like things. I like things to be the same. I like things to be uniform. I don't like schedules to get messed up or anything to get out of place. I, I do better that way when everything uh, is boring. I do a lot better that way. Take your Bible, turn to Galatians chapter 5, please, with me tonight. Galatians chapter 5, we're finally continuing our series entitled A Closer Look at Calvinism. Now, we're going to start in the Scriptures this evening and then continue with a little bit of historic background regarding the man John Calvin, who is credited with uh, really uh, putting into logical order and logical expression through his written works, the Institutes of the Christian Religion, Uh, the doctrines that have come to be known as Calvinism. For those of you who are with us perhaps for our first time tonight, let me emphasize the fact uh, that we are talking about extremist Calvinism or hyper-Calvinism. Okay, please understand that uh, hyper-extreme Calvinism, which, by the way, is finding its way into more and more places today. And we've gone over that a little bit, why that is, but we'll continue uh, to explain why that has come to pass in just a little bit. But we're in Galatians chapter 5. Look at verse number 16, please, with me. Galatians 5 and verse 16. The Bible says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Now, following, beginning at verse 17, you are going to have a dichotomy drawn between evidences of the Spirit and evidences of the flesh. There are certain activities that are fleshly in nature. There are other activities that are spiritual in nature. Why would God give us, as it were, a grocery list of the sins of the flesh, which we'll read about in just a moment, and then give us a grocery list of the fruit of the Spirit? Why would God give that to us? Here is the reason. So that we can discern what is of God. Now, ladies and gentlemen, please hear me. Please hear me. Not everything that claims to be of God is of God. Understand that. Things that are contradictory to the Scripture, to the Bible, are not of God. If it contradicts the Bible, God has given us certain characteristics by which we can make a discerning judgment regarding what is of God and what is not of God. And this is so important, especially in our day and time uh, when discernment is in very short supply. Look at verse number 17. He's going to begin for us the characteristics of the flesh. Verse 17. The Bible says, For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. In other words, he's describing there the struggle that takes place within every Christian. You have a flesh nature. You also have the Holy Spirit of God who dwells within you. The flesh nature oftentimes wants that which is contrary to the Holy Spirit. Hence the struggle that is in your life as a Christian. A person who is not saved does not know any struggle. The only issue they may have are the pangs of conscience, and a conscience can be easily stilled or altered. In fact, in our day and time, I believe that those who are attempting to engineer our society for liberalism have mastered the skill of changing or altering the national conscience. You say, preacher, what do you mean by that? Uh, For instance, there was a time when almost all Americans would have agreed that homosexuality is wrong, that it's an abomination before God. Today, that number is decreasing dramatically, and I fear, should the Lord tarry His coming, what ten years will bring in this nation in regard to that statistic alone. Why? The conscious of our nation, the uh, idea of an inner set of moral standards is being altered. You say, well, how is it happening? It is happening by an inundation from the media and from the educational realm, both of which have a liberal liberal leaning. And so we understand that. But these things, the flesh, those things of the flesh, are contrary to the things of the Spirit. They do not agree. Verse 18, But if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, manifest or revealed, which are these. Here they are. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, 
variance, that means strife, emulations, that means jealousy, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now that's very plain language. It's very plain language. Those are a list of things that indicate when an individual is controlled by the flesh. Some of those things are outward actions, such as adultery, which is listed there. Others have a doctrinal problems, such as heresy is a doctrinal issue. Still other things are more difficult to detect in an individual because they are things that are on the inside of a person, uh, such as envyings or seditions, those things. Murder, certainly that's an outward manifestation of the flesh. Uh, hatred, all of those things are manifestation of the flesh. Now, when those are present in the life of an individual, when those things are prominent in their life, when their life is controlled by those things, it is evidence that their life is not controlled by the Spirit of God. Does everyone understand that so far? That's given us to indicate where uh, that, that this group over here that is practitioners of these things, they are not controlled by the Spirit of God. Now, verse number 22. This is where the contrast begins. The dichotomy begins at verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit... In other words, that which is born of the Spirit, that which the Holy Spirit produces in one's life. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, that means patience, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Temperance means self-control. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. Now note again in verse 22 that list. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering. Notice this, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Those are the fruit of the Spirit. Contrast those mentally for just a moment with some of the things listed earlier in the chapter. The flesh. I now have a standard by which I can determine if an individual's actions are spiritual or fleshly. If someone is walking in the power of the Holy Spirit and so controlled by the Spirit that they are manifesting the life of the Spirit as revealed in verses 22 and 23, or if they are controlled by the lust of their own flesh and are manifesting that control in the verses 19 and following in the passage. So understand the difference in the dichotomy. You say, preacher, what in the world does this have to do with Calvinism? It has everything in the world to do with it because Jesus said this of false teachers, by their fruits ye shall know them. And if you study history, there is some amazing fruit, which we'll get into tonight, that would reveal to me at least a strong hesitance to be a professed follower of John Calvin and his teachings. Now, please understand, someone said, but Pastor John Calvin was a reformer. Yes, he was a reformer who did not reform far enough. I need to back up in history briefly in order to get us up to speed tonight. Please understand that the apostles were given the great commission of our Lord and then Jesus ascended to heaven. The church was established. The day of Pentecost had come. The dispensation of the church was fully established. And the apostles and the disciples and those who were their converts were given the charge of building the church, of planting churches, and of winning souls. They were expecting the Lord Jesus to come at any time. They faced great persecution from the Roman emperors. They faced in Jerusalem persecution from the Jews. Uh, the church in some quarters actually had to go underground. And we're familiar uh, with the catacombs of Rome as an example of that, where the church had to go underground because of the stiff persecution. When Constantine became the emperor, he made what I believe is a, was a purely political move. Someone said, oh, Constantine, the emperor that converted to Christ. There is no evidence that Constantine ever converted being born again by the Spirit of God to Jesus Christ. No evidence. Now, he did have some form of conversion, but I think his conversion was simply a political move. By the way, we have seen that uh, in our generation, have we not? Where presidents get in moral trouble and so then they tote a Bible into a church and make sure that the, uh, the news media is watching them carry a Bible into church. We've seen that. People using the, uh, the, uh, the office of 
presidency, or pardon me, religion to promote uh, the office of presidency. We've seen that in a former administration. We shall remain nameless from the pulpit tonight. Uh, we've, we've seen that. Constantine did something very much like that. He understood that he could unify his entire empire if all of a sudden this Christian religion, which heretofore had been uh, underground and persecuted, was elevated to the status of the state religion. Oh, well, someone will say, wait a minute, Pastor, didn't Constantine uh, author an edict of tolerance? Oh, I'm so glad you asked about the edict of tolerance. He did, and when he did that shortly thereafter, he found that tolerance would not work for him. He established the church, quote-unquote, as the state religion. And he said in the Edict of Tolerance that men would be allowed to worship as they chose, uh, any way they chose really, uh, within the guise of Christianity. Shortly thereafter, though, Constantine backed a persecution of a group of believers known as the Donatists. Now, the Donatists were those who had separated uh, from this big state church because they thought it was corrupt, and they had the audacity to rebaptize those who were converted to Christ soundly. They were called the Donatists. You say, Pastor, what happened? Constantine attempted to stamp them out. Augustine, who was Augustine, remember, the father of Roman Catholic theology, Augustine was in favor of the stamping out of these Donatists because they were schismatic. They did not, uh, they did not go along with the state church that had been established by Constantine. Now, please listen, please listen. The most dangerous thing for religion and for the state, the most dangerous thing for religion and for the state is the establishment of a state church. Very dangerous. You say, when did it happen? Fourth century under Constantine. It became the norm. The Roman Empire adopted what became known as Roman Catholicism uh, as the normal religious belief system within the empire. That was what he did. Politically, it was a, a brilliant move. He unified his empire around religion. But very shortly after the religion, that religion was elevated to the state religion, it became the persecutor of all who disagreed. Now follow me very closely. We do not believe in a state church. We do not believe in that. Wherever you have a state church, you will always have persecution. Wherever you, wherever you have a state church, you will always have corruption. The concept of a state-run church or a state-sponsored church is not a scriptural concept. But beginning in the 4th century, it became the norm. You say, Pastor, has it been passed on to us today? In many ways, it has. Did Protestantism establish a state church? Well, you say, but Pastor, Protestants came out of Rome. Certainly they did. But where they were most prevalent, they immediately established their brand of Protestantism as the state church. And so in Germany, as an example, the state church became the Lutheran church. In the Scandinavian countries, which is still true today, the state church was the Lutheran church. Uh, in different places, they established their religious brand of Protestantism as the state church. You say, Pastor, what happened? As soon as their brand of Protestantism rose to ascendancy, it began to persecute those who disagreed. Among whom were the ones persecuted? The Anabaptists. Folks, understand something. I'm not a Protestant. I'm not a Protestant. If you're a Baptist, you're not a Protestant. Because Baptists were never part of protesting anything. They were always persecuted. Now, I'm going to lay at your feet a challenge tonight. And if you want to take me up on it, fine. It will take some digging. I challenge you about something. The Baptists, the Anabaptist people, were typically a peaceful people. Now, in Germany, they had some kind of wild-eyed leaders at points in time. They had difficulties there in Germany. But typically, they were a peaceful people. By and large, the Anabaptist people, and I'm talking about Waldensians, Donatists, Hussites, I'm talking about all these different groups. By and large, the Anabaptist people, it can be said legitimately from history, were never the persecutors of any group anywhere but they were frequently those who were persecuted. And so it was when we consider the persecutions that even the Protestant church leveled against those who were Anabaptists. Now you say, Pastor, this is a revelation to me. Oh yes, we will find that John Calvin himself was a persecutor of those who disagreed with his views theologically. Now let's look at your outline this evening. Calvin, politician and persecutor. As has been amply demonstrated, Calvin borrowed much of his theology from the father of Roman Catholic theology, Augustine. 
Through Augustine, Calvin became convinced of the need to establish the kingdom of God on earth. Now, why would he do that? Because Augustine wrote a book entitled The uh, The City of God. Augustine, Augustine believed that the church was part of the city of God and that the church would establish God's kingdom on this earth. You say, where, where do we find that today? That's Reformed theology today, okay? Reformed theology says we've got to usher in the kingdom. Or Reformed theology says there'll be no kingdom. The kingdom in reality is the church. Regardless of what view you take as a Reformed theologian, you come up with the idea that somehow this kingdom is established in this world. If you believe that, that it is our duty to establish the kingdom of God in this world, then it is very easy to go from that belief to a state church. Does everyone understand that? It's very easy. Because after all, in the establishment of the kingdom of God on earth, I must control the politic of the kingdom. In order to control the politic of the kingdom, I have to run all of the laws, the judicial branch, in our, in our case, in our nation, and the uh, presidency. You say, are there people that believe in this in America today? Yes, there are. There are some that believe in this. We'll get into that in just a moment. At any rate, this step was taken, so through Augustine, Calvin became convinced of the need to establish the kingdom of God on earth. Upon rising to power in Geneva, Switzerland, Calvin sought to establish God's kingdom through political maneuvering and persecution, methods approved by Augustine and practiced by Rome. What happened in Geneva? Geneva was a town that had tacitly converted to Protestantism. Through his influence, John Calvin arose to great power, and I'm not going to go into the whole story tonight, but John Calvin arose to great power and influence in Geneva and finally was asked by what would be roughly analogous to our concept of a city or town council, was finally asked to come and in essence become the mayor of the town. This was far, this was far more than what we would know in America today as being the mayor of a town. Uh, he literally became the dictator of Geneva. And it was amazing the things that he accomplished. There are historians who have said that no dictator in history ever ruled anything more thoroughly than did John Calvin rule Geneva. You say, preacher, what took place after his ascendancy to power? Look at point A. Calvin sought to force, put the word force in the blank there, to force his brand of Christianity upon the citizens of Geneva. Today, Reconstructionists view Geneva as an ideal model for the Christianizing of America. You say, Pastor, what is a Reconstructionist? A Reconstructionist is one who is, uh, is an adherent to Reformation or Reformed theology, who takes it a step further and believes that it is his duty to reconstruct God's kingdom on this earth and thus Christianize America. You say, Pastor, are there people who believe in this? Absolutely. And they seek by political ends to gain power and influence. Now, I'm thankful whenever someone godly is elected to office, okay? I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful for our president. President Bush is not a perfect man, but I'm thankful for our president. I appreciate the fact that here is a man that we repeatedly hear rumors about uh, his faith and about his Bible reading, and about some of the uh, peculiarities is what they would consider them today uh, in regard to his religious belief. I'm thankful for that. I'd rather hear rumors about that than rumors about wi uh, women uh, not married to him in the White House. I'd certainly rather hear about that. Uh, he's not a perfect man. I'm glad, though, when good men are elected. However, listen, I do not believe for five seconds that electing certain men to office will usher in the kingdom of God. I do not believe we will be able to Christianize America. In fact, if you look around, we are losing the culture war dramatically. That's the bottom line. I'm convinced of it. You say, oh, pastor, that's gloom and doom. No, it's not. Jesus is coming again. We may be losing the culture war, but we're about to give up ship anyway. <laughs> we're heading out of here when the Lord returns and, and things are waxing worse and worse. Reconstructionists, though, are those today uh, who would say that we have to establish God's kingdom on earth. The Bible gives us no such mandate. Point B, John Calvin sought to force the citizens of Geneva to conform to his standards by a system of in-home visits by authorities. This is interesting. According to Will Durant, these authorities, quote, questioned the occupants on all phases of their lives, the allowable color, put the word color there, color and quantity of clothing, the number of dishes permissible at a meal were specified by law. Jewelry and lace were frowned upon. A woman was jailed for arranging her hair at an immoral height. 
at an immoral height. I don't even know what that would mean, ladies. If you can arrange your hair at an immoral height, I don't know. But they would be jailed for that. Uh, Why? John Calvin had his hand over every aspect of the lives of the citizenry of Geneva. Every aspect. Now, folks, you talk about dictatorial. This is dictatorial. And even though more control was exercised in those times, typically uh, by the state and somewhat was more intrusive in many respects, Calvin had doubled that or tripled that uh, successfully in Geneva. Point C. Calvin instituted a rigorous censorship of the press, banning books with which he disagreed. To speak disrespectfully of Calvin or his preachers was a crime that could be punishable by banishment. Now, ladies and gentlemen, where do you find the priesthood of the believer in that? The Bible plainly teaches that as a believer in Christ, I am a priest before God. That I am responsible for my relationship to God. I am a believer priest. That my faith is my responsibility, not the responsibility of some other man. And that my relationship to God is a personal matter that is taught in the Scripture. Calvin, on the other hand, said, Oh no, if you disagree with me on any point, I can banish you from the city. That is a dictatorship, ladies and gentlemen, that is intolerable. By the way, it is also intolerable in Bible-believing churches. You have a right, ladies and gentlemen, to read your Bible and to ask the Holy Spirit of God to teach you from the Bible what the Scriptures say. You do not have to accept every interpretation that you hear. You have a right to read your Bible for yourself. And I encourage you, read the Bible, know the Bible, understand the Bible. You say, but Pastor, it's good enough. You read it, you understand it, you tell me what it says. Dangerous. Never get into that mentality. That is dangerous. Why? Because then your faith is no longer in God's revelation, the Bible, but it becomes in me. And I am a fallible human being. And when I'm preaching the Bible, you need to open your Bible and say, does the Bible say what the preacher says it says? And if it doesn't, if you have a question, come up to me after the service and say, Preacher, hey, I don't know if I agree with that or there is an issue here. Can you explain this to me? But ladies and gentlemen, we put ourselves in a grave state whenever we simply accept the dictates of a man because we love and trust him, okay? And I'm saying that as the pastor of the church. The Bible is our final authority. Continuing on, point D, fornication was punishable by exile or drowning. You could be drowned for that in in Calvin's Geneva. Adultery, blasphemy, and idolatry were punishable by death. Right away, I put the word death there, by the way. Right away, I hear some say, oh, but pastor, some of those, uh, those punishments were prescribed in the Old Testament. Oh, I'm so glad you brought that up. Now let me explain. Augustine, as an example, was one who confused Israel and the church. Now please follow me. Reformed theology confuses Israel and the church. The Bible teaches in the Old Testament that Israel was a theocracy initially. It later became a monarchy. But Israel was to be a theocracy under God. Under the standards of a theocracy, God Himself ruled as king. Being that God was king, He could establish the standards that He wanted, which we find in our Old Testament. That is why Israel operated under a theocratic standpoint. Now follow me. The church, once Israel was set aside, according to the book of Romans, the church became the operative agent through which God is ministering to His world in this dispensation. The church is different from Israel. Folks, Israel is a nation. Israel has boundaries. Israel has uh, had at one time a king, Solomon, David, the other kings of Israel, and on and on and on. That is a nation. The church is not a nation so far as we understand with boundaries as is Israel. There is a difference between Israel and the church. Now watch. Augustine equated Israel with the church. That error was, ca- was carried into Romanism. Romanism transferred that error into Protestantism. So wherever the Protestants took control, they established a state church because they saw no difference between the nation, uh, the state, and the church. They established a state church. They confused both. And then they drew things from the Old Testament economy to apply in the New Testament age, which they had no right to legitimately apply. You say, Pastor, did that ever happen in the United States of America? Yes. The answer is yes. There were two groups who came in colonial, and this is, this is just, I'll get through this. Two groups who came in colonial America. Remember, we had the Puritans. Do you remember the Puritans? How many remember them? They, uh, you know, we just had Thanksgiving, okay? Now, what is the other group? It begins with a P. 
Puritans and Pilgrims. Very good. How many of you knew that there's a difference between the Puritans and the Pilgrims? There is a, good. There's a huge difference between the Puritans and the Pilgrims. The Puritans were those who viewed the Church of England as corrupt. And so they left England because they felt that the church was hopelessly corrupt, but they wanted to purify their belief system from the inside. They didn't want to separate wholly from the church. They were just going to have a more pure church, the Church of England, established on American soil. The pilgrims were different. The pilgrims were Anabaptistic in their doctrine. The pilgrims said this, Ah, that whole church, the Church of England, is corrupt. Protestantism is corrupt. We're going to go back to the Bible the pilgrims were the separatists. If I lived in that day and time, then I would be a pilgrim. I would not be a Puritan. I would be a pilgrim. The Puritans would be roughly analogous to new evangelicals, and the pilgrims would be roughly analogous to fundamentalists. Now, he's preacher, why all of that? Because the pilgrims, taking their cue again from the state church that was created by Henry VIII, the Anglican church, state church, Taking their cue from the state church, what did the Puritans do? They came to Massachusetts, they established the Massachusetts Bay Colony, and it was run by Puritan preachers. Guess who got kicked out of the Massachusetts Bay Colony for disagreeing with Puritan doctrine? The founder of the First Baptist Church of Rhode Island. He was a Baptist, and he was kicked out of the Puritan colony for disagreeing with the Puritan religious teachers. Well, preacher, why did they practice banishment? Because they were establishing, follow me, the kingdom of God on earth. That's not what we're doing. That's not what we're here for. But the Puritans believed that. They said ours is a city set upon a hill. And what they meant by that was the city of God. And it harkened back to the teachings of Augustine. The pilgrims, on the other hand, didn't do those things. They weren't practicing those things. They were separatists. They were baptistic. And they were practicing the, the relig their uh, freedom to worship God. Did the Puritans take some of the Old Testament commands and punishments for moral failure and practice them in America? Yes, they did. They practiced some of those things. Is that legitimate? No, it is not. Why? This is not a theocracy Israel was a theocracy. Does everyone understand the difference here, the dichotomy, as far as history goes? So we've seen that even in American history. Point E, a child was beheaded for striking his parents. Beheaded. This is all in Geneva, Switzerland. A uh, child was beheaded for striking his parents. Point F, in one year alone, there were 414 prosecutions for moral offenses. Between 1542 and 1564, there were 76 banishments and 58 executions. The total population was under 20,000. This in John Calvin's Geneva. You say, well, preacher, don't the admirers of Calvin try to justify him? Those who understand the history, and I've read, by the way, both sides of this, admit that they have a lot of difficulty justifying the bloodiness with which John Calvin ruled his city. This would not be the way that somebody who, in my view, who was filled with the Holy Spirit and who exhibited the fruit of the Spirit, according to Galatians chapter 5, uh, would behave. But we continue on. Point two, John Calvin's dictatorial authority. John Calvin both established and codified the law of Geneva. He imposed his brand of Christianity with floggings, imprisonments, banishments, and burnings at the stake. Put the word burnings at the stake. Uh, this is not Christianity, as is biblical. You cannot force anyone into conversion, ladies and gentlemen. You cannot legislate religion. You cannot do that. Conversion to Christ is a matter of the heart. I cannot force anyone to turn to Christ. I can plead with them. I can preach the gospel. I can tell them that Jesus died on the cross for their sins. But I cannot force them by a threat of burning at the stake to believe as I believe. This practice, again comes from the belief of a state church. It comes from following uh, the ideas of a confusion of Israel and the church, and it is a confusion indeed. Now, those who would be the great defenders of John Calvin would say, oh, Pastor John Calvin was one of the greatest exegetes of the Bible that the world has ever known. I take issue with that. He was not a dispensationalist and therefore could not accurately exegete the Scripture, period. He confused Israel and the church and applied different things here, there, and everywhere, uh, much to the disaster that became Geneva. Point B, he has been called, Calvin has, the Protestant Pope. Church historian Philip Schaff, who was a liberal, said this, It was a glaring inconsistency that those who had just shaken off the yoke of popery as an intolerable burden should subject their conscience and intellect to a human creed 
In other words, substitute for the old Roman popery a, modest, uh, a modern Protestant popery. This is uh, uh, Philip Scharf saying that, and he is absolutely correct. That is what they did, in essence, in Geneva. Uh, John Calvin became the end of the law. And again, we say, well, well, Pastor, that was in those days. It is possible, ladies and gentlemen, for men to arise to such prominence in our day and time if we're not careful. Being a biblicist, following the Bible as our faith and practice, is the safeguard to all of this. We can look back at history and say, well, weren't they foolish to follow uh, so blindly and to subject themselves to this uh, literally tyranny? Weren't they foolish to do that? Uh, But I would hasten to remind you that any time we put up anything but the Bible as our authority, we are under the possibility of coming under the thumb of tyranny. You say, Preacher, why would anyone look to anything but the Bible? Because it's easier sometimes to follow a charismatic leader than it is to open the pages of the Scripture and find out what the Lord has to say. That's really why it comes down to it. It's just easier. Well, we're going to do whatever He says. We trust Him. Trust your Bible. Point C. Calvin's control was all-pervasive and absolute. Calvin was involved in every, put the word every, conceivable aspect of city life. Now, you talk about a control freak. Safety regulations to protect children, laws against recruiting mercenaries, new inventions, the introduction of cloth manufacturing, and even dentistry. He had an opinion about everything. I'll tell you this. This is just an aside for your information. I know a lot of preachers, okay? And the preachers tend to be men of opinion. It is usually best for us who are preachers to keep our opinions to things of the Bible and things spiritual. When I go off having opinions about other areas of life, it is usually fraught with trouble. The other day on my day off, of course, it always happens on Monday morning, the washing machine, it, it did something awful. It started pouring water all over the floor, and water was pouring down into the basement, and it was becoming very unpleasant. He said, Preacher, did you call the repairman? <laughs> no, I fixed it myself. It will never be the same again, let me tell you. I, I, I tore that thing apart, pulled the sides off of it, pulled the top off of it, found some hose that was leaking. I said, eh, you don't need that hose. So I pulled that hose out. And uh, you said, what did you do? You left a hole where the hose went in. I plugged it. Got me a piece of wood and some putty, put her in there. She doesn't leak anymore. I just told my wife she can no longer use bleach because that was where you pour the bleach down. But, uh, you know, whatever. And... Uh, I, I, I'm Listen, it, don't call me to fix your washer, okay? I, I, I don't have opinions on every aspect of life. Calvin did, and no man can know everything. He, he certainly had opinions. He was consulted not only uh, on all important state affairs, but on the supervision of the markets and assistance for the poor. He held uh, complete control over that city. Now, again, this is the people of that city giving him that level of authority, and then he came along uh, in a very dictatorial manner in regard to this. Point D, Calvin established then a confession of faith and made adherence to it mandatory for all citizens. This is incredible. 20,000 people, ladies and gentlemen, lived in that city. And yet he said, you will all believe exactly as I say. Now, we already have a law that the Institutes of the Christian Religion, his book, could not be criticized. Now he has, uh, he has established a confession. Uh, will Durant, a secular historian, says this, All the claims of the popes for the supremacy of the church over the state were renewed by Calvin for his church. Why do you think that's true? Because we have confused Israel and the church. Because we have confused politics and religion. Because we are, with Augustine, attempting to establish the kingdom of God on earth. All of these things are part of this, ladies and gentlemen. It is a confusion. Reformation theology always brings this confusion to bear. Calvin was as thorough as any pope, put the word pope there, in rejecting individualism of belief. Now, one of the tenets of being a Baptist, by the way, one of the Baptist distinctives is the priesthood of the believer that I as an individual can read and study and understand my Bible for myself. I'm going to give you a revelation, folks, that this may absolutely astound you. Do you know that you do not always have to come to the exact same conclusion uh, as your preacher in regard to your reading of the Scripture? Now, on the basic doctrines, the deity of Jesus Christ, yes, you must conform. Our doctrinal statement talks about that. To be a member of this church, you believe the basic things of the doctrinal statement, which are basic, sound Bible doctrine. I'm not talking about that. 
But on interpretive areas, you may disagree with your pastor. That is, that is fully possible. Now, when we get to heaven, the Lord will set you straight and all those good things. But uh, it may be that you'll have some issues here and there. You have a right to read your Bible, to compare Scripture with Scripture, and ask the Lord, Lord, show me from your word your truth. The Bible is a living book. It is not something that is merely subject to my own interpretation that I then inflict upon you and say, this is exactly what you must believe. As a Christian, I have the high privilege of opening the book of God and reading it for myself. And the Holy Spirit being my teacher of the things of God and applying specifically that Bible to my life on a daily basis. Folks, that is a high privilege. Is it any wonder we emphasize, read your Bible, read your Bible, read your Bible, read your Bible. The most dangerous thing we can do is set our Bible aside and say, well, preacher, tell us what God said. Dangerous. Dangerous. You get in the book. By the way, if you do, you know, what, happens when, what happens when the White Castle hamburgers catch up to me? And I'm laid out in the casket somewhere. What happens then? If you've gotten to know the book of God... Your faith rests in the Bible, not in a man. Understand how important that is. Calvin rejected individualism of belief. This greatest legislator of Protestantism completely repudiated that principle of private judgment with which the new religion had begun. In Geneva, those who could not accept it would have to seek other habitats. They'd have to move. Persistent absence from Protestant services or continual refusal to take the Eucharist was punishable by offense. Uh, by, by, was a punishable offense. Uh, these were the laws in Calvin's Geneva. There is no way, really, that you can legitimately glorify the history of this place except to say that it was totalitarian in the extreme and based upon a theological system, which we call Reformed theology, that is fraught uh, with problems. Point E. Several additional examples of persecution. I just garnered these from various sources. Jerome Bolzek disagreed with Calvin's doctrine of predestination, and he said this. He said, Those who posit an eternal decree in God by which he has ordained some to life and the rest to death make him a tyrant. Put the word tyrant in your blank. That's all that man said. He was a citizen of the city of Geneva. He made that statement, made it publicly. For these words he was banished from his home. Persecution, folks. I don't see that as being the fruit of the Spirit. Point two, John Trolliot criticized Calvin's institutes, stating that Calvin had made God, quote, the author of sin, unquote. Well, by the way, the institutes of the Christian religion state that, that God has ordained men to sin. The institutes of the Christian religion teach that when you sin, you are forced to sin because God has decreed it to be so. That is exactly what John Calvin taught, exactly what he taught. This man was merely stating that, and in stating that, uh, the court decreed that, quote, thenceforward no one should dare to speak against this book, the Institutes, and its doctrines. You couldn't open your mouth. Dangerous, dangerous thinking here. Jacques Gruet, having been accused of placing a placard on Calvin's pu uh, pulpit calling him a gross hypocrite. Now, when I read about this, I had to chuckle. You know, I, I love it when the teens put little notes on the pulpit, you know, before the Sunday night service, and they say, preach hard, preacher, or, you know, the teenagers get excited and they put up a little silly note. I like that, but this man, uh, this man was accused. It is unknown if he actually did it, but he was accused, Jacques was, of putting up a, putting up a placard that said, among other things, gross hypocrite. He suffered torture at the hands of Calvin twice daily for 30 days. After this, he finally confessed, though it is unknown as to whether or not he really did it or not. He may have just confessed to, cease the, to see the, source, the, the torture cease. After finally confessing, he was tied to a stake, his feet were nailed to it, and his head was cut off. Nice way of dealing with notes behind the pulpit. <laughs> Unbelievable. Uh, even if someone did put up a big piece of paper and call me a gross hypocrite, even if they did, I don't think it would be appropriate to have the deacon call them out and cut off their head. I just don't think it would be, I don't think it would be a Christ-like response. But again, this level of violence can only be justified by a confusion of theology. Somebody said, oh, pastor, you can make the Bible say whatever you want. And um, you've been hearing this a lot lately. Well, there has been an awful lot of bloodshed in the name of Christianity. You've been hearing that in the media. Show me from the New Testament anywhere where there, there is a mandate to shed blood in the name of Christ. I don't want to hear what 
Pope Urbane II had to say when he attempted to speak ex cathedra. I'm not interested in that. I want you to show me from the New Testament where there is anywhere the command to shed blood in the defense of or for the propagation of the Christian faith. I lay down that challenge. You show me. You show me. You can't show me. Well, Pastor, what about those wars in the Old Testament? The Old Testament was Israel. The New Testament is the church. There is a difference. But if you are reformed in your theology, there is no difference, and you can mix the two. So the drawing of the sword then becomes something justifiable in any theology that mixes Israel and the church. From Augustine on, the drawing of the sword in the defense of the Christian faith became something that was justifiable. And hear me, please. All of the Protestant groups practiced it at one time or another. All of them, okay? Understand, these are... These are this is history. It's just how it happened. It is history. Uh, point four. A visiting Lutheran minister praised the weekly investigations into the conduct and even the smallest transgressions of the citizens of Geneva. Now, he was a Lutheran. He was visiting. He later said that he couldn't stay in, in uh, Geneva because he differed with them religiously on some points. But he was a Lutheran who thought it was just great that on a weekly basis folks came to check out your house and see what you were up to. And that doesn't sound like a way that any of us would want to live. Then point five, and I didn't have time to go into this tonight, but Calvin sentenced this arch-heretic Miguel Cerveto to death for two counts of heresy. Now here were the heresies that he was sentenced to death for Unitarianism. And certainly that is a heresy, the belief that everybody goes to heaven. That's an error. However, we do not put people to death because they believe in that, okay? Uh, that fellow who wrote the book uh, Front Porch Tales, what's his name? Phil Gully. Phil Gully is Unitarian, okay? Now, uh, just because he's Unitarian doesn't mean that I uh, orchestrate an armed mob to go to his house in Danville or Plainfield, wherever he lives, and burn him at the stake. We do not do that. There is no uh, allowance in Scripture for that kind of behavior. Unitarianism is an error, but we do not persecute those who are in error. What do you do? You try to win them with the truth. You cannot persecute them. And then the second point of this, uh, of this death sentence came because this man dared to reject infant baptism. Ooh, sounds like I've got a whole room full of Baptists that are in trouble on that one, okay? Uh, put to death. This man was put to death on those two counts. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I bring you back to what we said at the beginning, Galatians chapter 5. The fruit of the flesh, if you will, or the, the marks of the flesh, the works of the flesh, flesh are manifest. Hatred, murder, wrath, strife, sedition. Sounds like a lot of the works of the flesh dominated the governing of Geneva. The fruit of the Spirit is love. Joy, peace, long-suffering. Listen to this one. Gentleness. Gentleness. That's part of the fruit of the Spirit. Goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Those are the fruit of the Spirit. Understanding this cursory glance at history would indicate to me that it appears that in the governing of Geneva, John Calvin certainly did not manifest the fruit of the Spirit. It was said by one of his defenders, Mr. Uh, Bettner, who has written a book called The Reformed Doctrine of Predestination, Mr. Bettner said that John Calvin, if he found in the Scripture a contradiction to his belief system, he would immediately turn to the Scripture and he would change his practice to conform to the dictates of Christ. Where do you find burning people at the stake? You don't find that. As far as an exegete of Scripture goes, John Calvin was weak because he misinterpreted much of the Bible. We'll have more to say about this next time. Let's pray. Father, thank You for Your Word. Thank You, Lord, for its clarity. Lord, thank You for the belief system that is given us in the New Testament. Lord, we have the Gospel. It is a Gospel of loving people. We tell them the truth. We don't shrink from the truth, but we love them. We understand, Lord, that we cannot convert any by coercion or force. And so, Father, we pray that You would use the simple proclamation of the Gospel and Your Holy Spirit working in hearts to bring men and women to Christ. I pray, Father, that we would become students of the Bible, understanding it so clearly, its intricacies, its differences, weighing the Scripture, comparing Scripture with Scripture, that we would be careful students to rightly divide the Word of Truth 
to properly resent, uh, to present you to an age that knows not Christ. Bless, I pray, these thoughts in Jesus' name. Amen. All right.